Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to another episode of the Ahmed Khan podcast. I'm very excited today to discuss a topic which I've been meaning to discuss for some time now. And that is the legacy of one of the world's greatest living philosophers, someone who has had a, a huge impact upon my own philosophy. And that is none other than Sayyid Muhammad Naqib al Atas, who is based in Malaysia. His philosophy has had a drastic influence on not only Malaysia, where he resides, but around the entire Muslim world. He has published several masterpieces such as Islam and Secularism and the Prolegomena to the Metaphysics of Islam. Alhamdulillah, today we are honored to be joined by Professor Dr. Wan, who is a professor, educational administrator, intellectual activist, and a poet. Previously, he was the founder and former director for the Center of Advanced Studies on Islam, Science, and Civilization. He has a master's in education and a PhD in Islamic thought from the, from the prominent, notorious University of Chicago. Subsequently, he served at the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization. In terms of publications, Dr. Wan has published more than 16 books and monographs, over 40 research articles in local and international journals, and in direct relation today to, to today's topic, he is a direct student of Professor Atas and currently holds the Sayyid Muhammad Naqib al Atas Chair of Islamic Thought. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Wan. Thank you very much, Alam. Walaikum salam It's so, nice to be here. Nice to meet you online. Uh, as I was telling uh, one of the brothers beforehand, Malaysia is, uh, is a hidden treasure to the rest of the world, mashallah. And uh, many of the gems in Malaysia are hidden from us. And so this podcast aims to bring to light one of the greatest intellectual treasures during our time, which is Professor Sayyid Naqib al Atas, as well as someone like yourself, Dr. Wan, who is, uh, who is a real formidable intellect as well. Jazakallah khair. So before we get directly into Professor al Atas, I would like to read his biography to people because it's very important to realize that the person that we are going to be discussing is a very remarkable intellectual who has had a profound influence on many of our countries. As a scholar of Islam, Professor Naqib al Atas has made significant contributions to the contemporary world of Islam in the domains of the Islamization of contemporary knowledge and of Muslim education. He was responsible for the conceptualization of the Islamic University, which he initially formulated at the first World Conference on Muslim Education, which was held in Mecca in 1979. And he founded and directed the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization. Professor Atas has written extensively in the fields of Islamic philosophy, theology, metaphysics, history, literature, art, religion, and education. He is among the few contemporary scholars who is thoroughly rooted in the traditional Islamic sciences. And in terms of publications, he has published masterpieces such as his book, Islam and Secularism and the Prolegomena to the Metaphysics of Islam. And to cap it off, his brilliance resulted in him being conferred the Imam Al-Ghazali Lifetime Achievement Award for reviving the spirit of Islam. And Although I've given a, bio, a brief biography, it still doesn't do justice to the work that Professor Atlas and the legacy that he's had with us today. So Dr. Wan, my first question to you is, as somebody who's one of the closest people to Professor Atlas, can you give us some indication of the type of person that Professor Atlas is? And what are some of the great contributions that he's made to the Muslim world? Yeah, thank you, Brother Ahmed Khan, for inviting me to your, to your program. Uh, nice to meet you again, Alhamdulillah, and uh, you, you have done a very good, great work by having this program and by inviting me to, to try to share my thoughts and experience with uh, this scholar that we're talking about today, Professor Sainz Mohan Of course, uh, as, a, as a person, he, uh, to me, he's a, he's a person that has been, mis has been much uh, misunderstood uh, because of uh, 
he cannot be put in a particular pigeon hole. Although he's a scholar of Islam, but he's not uh, traditionally linked to that because he was trained thoroughly also in modern Western universities. So he understood very well, not only Islamic learning from traditional perspectives, because he came from the family of those Muslim scholars who came to Islam in the Malay world, the Ba'alawi Sayyid, mm -hmm. who, who brought Islam to this part of the world and, and unified the whole Malay world from Cambodia, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, Singapore yeah, for several centuries, beginning from the ninth century onward. Uh, and of course, uh, he was also trained in the military sciences. He studied in Sandhurst and returned home and fought against the communists as well. Uh, so he's not only a scholar from both uh, traditions, but also he was a, a military officer trained in the best military centers in the West at that time, Sandhurst Military Academy. Uh, he also came from a political family because he stayed with uh, three of the um, most influential chief ministers of Johor in southern part of Malaysia, one of whom later on founded AMNO, United Malay National Organization. Uh, and Prof. Al Atas was the one who, who designed the flag of AMNO because he was, he was deciding with that chief minister before. They were formulating this new organization for Malaysian independence in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, so intellectually, of course, he's a polymath. Uh, he understood not only um, Islamic sciences, various parts of it, theology, tasawwuf, uh, or the Quran, uh, his Islamic history also, and, and modern, modern what we call philosophies, in, in the most important aspect of it, modern history as well. Uh, but also he's a he's an architect. He not only built his own house, which is with a very specific uh, Andalusian Muslim design, but later on he built his stack. You know, mm. both the first campus and the second campus. We unify the, the Malay, Middle Eastern, Andalusian uh, architectural traditions as such. And he also built uh, uh, his not just physically, but intellectually, his curriculum, his library, and provide with it uh, a certain uh, uh, intellectual and ethical spirit, which can be seen uh, uh, in many of his students who studied there and who are involved in many aspects uh, in academic and, and, and other, other dimensions in the Malay world and outside. So that's briefly uh, what I can say about Professor Atas with regard to his background and his uh, general abilities. You know, Dr. Wan, you bring up an excellent point that Professor Atas is more than just a scholar of Islam. Um, he was somebody who was trained in the military sciences he is somebody also who is a Sayyid, someone who, is, uh, who has a direct lineage of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But I think one of the most remarkable feats of Professor al -Tas, like you mentioned, is that he was an architect. And I had the great privilege of going to the first and second campuses of ISTAC. And I, I will attach a picture of what ISTAC is for those who don't know, but it's one of the most beautiful architectures I've ever seen when I was in Malaysia and just seeing the Andalusian vibes that gave to it. And I'll tell you something very funny, Dr. Wan, is when I was in, when I was at ISTAC uh, in, uh, in Malaysia, I took a picture of uh, the ISTAC campus and I posted it online and I, and people, people thought I was in Spain. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> because yeah. it, with the palm trees and the, the, the type of architecture that was there, <clears throat> but to see that a scholar of Islam was, was able to do something like this reveals the great intellectual capacity of an individual. And the library itself was brilliant. And so for those who don't know, Professor Alpas is rightly, we could use the term polymath to identify him, subhanAllah. Um, but in terms of Professor Alpas's uh, working with international on an international scale with Muslim governments um, in the realms of education. Uh, can you tell us briefly, did any governments engage with them? Did they give him any awards? Of course, with regard to awards, uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, uh, he was given several awards. One of them is, of course, the Iqbal Award by the government of Pakistan. The, um, uh, the, the late Shah of Iran, 
I think gave a national award there also. Uh, uh, and also OIC uh, through, I think, uh, OIC through Irsika in Istanbul gave him award in excellent research in Islamic civilization. Uh, and the Malaysian government also uh, gave an award uh, beside the Al Atas Al Ghazali chair at, at ISTEC, but also the, the uh, Merdeka Award to commemorate our Independence Day. You know, uh, he was given uh, an award there also. So various other universities gave him um, uh, honorary degrees from Sudan and from other parts of the world as well. But mm. but he uh, interestingly he and he he tried to instill this in his students that he stressed on sincerity, mm. you know, not to be recognized, not to seek recognition uh, for his own sake, but to pursue the truth, to to follow in the great uh, tradition of, of the prophets. Salam and, and the truth follow the past and to benefit also from the scholars of, of other traditions as well. That's why when he built the library of his tech, he selected, he personally selected uh, more than 75% of the book and the manuscripts, yeah, which reflect not only Islamic thought and civilization in various languages, but also the thought and civilization of, of, of Europe, of Japan, of China, of India. Uh, because because Malaysia is in that in that uh, intersection between the east and the west, mm -hmm. so the scholars who are going to, to to come and study Islam here must be able to acquaint themselves with all these uh, traditions. You know? mm. uh, uh, and of course, I respect also he, uh, he he consciously planned to have uh, scholars from all madhab. Of course, we are Sunnis, you know, we are Shafi'i mm -hmm. in terms of law, we are Ash'ari in terms of theology. We are Ghazalian in talk yeah? about but had he stepped before during, during his leadership, and I was very fortunate, alhamdulillah, to be able to assist him in some of these areas. He, he invited scholars from Turkey, from Iran, from Pakistan, yeah? uh, from, uh, from other parts of the world, Muslim and non-Muslim as well, yeah? while being sure of, of what we are. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But the ability to, to engage, the ability to listen and respect one another, is it's very important to, to his concept of education because it is rooted from his understanding of adab. Mm. Adab is a discipline to recognize and see different things in, in the system, which is our worldview, so that we recognize and place Allah in his in the order of being in existence. So whatever we do, you know, it is supposed to, to, to reflect our, our 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 awareness of God's presence in our mind, in our behaviors. In our actions, in our policies, and such. So when mm. he, he designed the campus of ISTEC, he designed the library, when he recruited students and staff, all these things were, were directly and indirectly transmitted there. Mm. But people see only the physical part of it, the physical part of the building, <laughs> the physical part of the library. Yes? <laughs> but they don't see the, the ethos that permeated uh, all these aspects. That's why when he was possibly removed, and his vision was changed drastically uh, from 2002 onward. Uh, attempt has been made to revive it. It's like, for example, the institution which is built from scratch. Mm -hmm. But apparently, uh, according to many people who have been there, who have followed that, they have not come close to what he was trying to establish in, in a few short years. Because, mm -hmm. because he started with knowledge and he always emphasized in personal knowledge and sincerity. He told me that the uh, Dr. one he said that when we recruit students to come to East Tech, when we recruit staff to come here, do not use money to attract them. Do not say that the salary will be this, the scholarship will be this, the grant will be that. Mm -hmm. But explain our vision, our mission, and see whether or not they understand, they share this thing. And if they agree and share, then we'll try to, to give them the best that we have. Yeah. Of course, the best financial structure financial offer that we have is not very much compared to the one in Europe, the one in America, for example. Yeah? Yeah. But still, very prominent and able scholars come from many parts of the world. Some come for a long term, some come for a shorter term. Yeah? But everybody seems to be able to live in a, in a harmonious manner, respecting him as a scholar, as a thinker, as a builder, and mm -hmm. respect the ethos. There was no, no quarrel that we cannot handle, no differences that we cannot settle, for example. Mm -hmm. Because people know how to deal with differences. Like, yeah. 
And dealing with differences requires understanding who you are first. Your, your confidence in your own in your own understanding of who you are, your, your, your purpose in life, what you want to do, but you also understand other people's abilities and contribution for our larger and, and common purpose. That's very important. Hmm. You know, subhanAllah, you brought up so many good points, um, especially in regards to the architecture. Too often we get caught up on the physical component and we neglect, you know, the ethos, you know, the spiritual component within it. And just walking through that, um, that remarkable, uh, that remarkable facility, um, there's just, there's a sense of uh, tranquility that you feel while you're there, despite how hot it was that day when I was there, um, the tranquility that I received um, was something that uh, I took with me as I went back home and I showed others that this is a university and our universities should be beautiful. Um, and so when we talk about the legacy of somebody like Professor Atas, the architecture is something which is beautiful. But when we look at him on an international scale, like you mentioned, Professor Atas was given the Iqbal Medal by the president of Pakistan in 1979. And Javed uh, Iqbal, who is the son of Alama Iqbal, said that his father's dream was realized in Malaysia when he attended the launch of ISTAC. And hmm. when we look at Iran is a good example that you brought up. In 1975, he was conferred fellow of the Imperial Iranian Academy of Philosophy for outstanding contribution in the field of comparative philosophy. You have places like Sudan, the University of Khartoum conferred upon him the degree of honorary doctorate of arts in 1995. And even you have a place like Russia where the Russian Academy of Science has honored him in a special presentation to the academics. Uh, to the ac uh, academics. And last, the last one I will mention is in 2006, the president of Iran requested a personal audience with Professor Atas, hugged him and said, Professor Atas, your wisdom has guided us all the way here in Iran. And I think one of the biggest, um, one of the most prominent students of Professor Atas, somebody who has consistently proclaimed the greatness of Professor Atas is someone like Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, who has repeatedly mentioned the importance of studying someone like Naqib al-Pas. And I think ultimately, at the end of the day, even if the name Sayyid Muhammad Naqib al-Pas is not necessarily remembered, his ideas will be remembered. And his ideas have spread throughout much of the Western world um, through his students. And I consider myself a student of his, having read his books and having met him in person when I was in Malaysia. But his work goes international. Um, and is there anything else you would like to add to that component, Dr. Wan, of him being known across the world as one of the great philosophers of our time? Um, yes, uh, with regard to the region, uh, of course, before, before him, there have been a few scholars who were born in the Malay world uh, have contributed to the regional understanding of Islam, meaning that their, their, their work were read by, by people outside the region, as far as even uh, in Mecca, some were teaching in Mecca also. But, but with Prof. al perhaps it's the first time where the ideas of scholars who write from the Malay world are being interpreted, are being studied beyond the Muslim world. Hmm. This is the first time perhaps in our history. Uh, it's read even in Japan, in Russia, of course, uh, in, in Bosnia, in Europe, uh, in America, of course, yeah? by Muslim and uh, by non-Muslim alike. Uh, I remember uh, Jennifer Webb from, from Adelaide, Australia, from Tantlana Program, which is a very prestigious private organization. They published a two-volume book on perspectives on good society, which they use uh, as a basic teaching material for uh, young leaders in Australia. Mm -hmm. In that two-volume book, uh, they contain selections of the what they regard the greatest thinkers in the history of the world, from pre-Socratic uh, scholars all the way to the modern modern uh, Nobel Prize winners, Chinese philosophers, Hindu thinkers. The only Muslim scholar whom they included in that particular text is Professor Atas. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Of course, oh, they no. should have they should have included other Muslim scholars also, yeah? like Al Ghazali, and uh, of course the Prophet should be the first one. Yeah? Uh, but 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 uh, but for them, Prophet uh, Atta represent that tradition of the Muslim, not just the past but the present too. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, and the, the 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 material which they still like is from Islamic secularism called the Westernization of knowledge. <laughs> That's a very powerful idea. Um, so, mm -hmm. of, of course, um, uh, I think his, his one of the major contribution for modern Muslim is on the continual, his continual uh, emphasis on importance of knowledge and ethical development as rooted in Adab, for example. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, follow him since 19, 1987, since I joined him at this time before. And whenever he speaks about modern Muslim problems, and when people he, he answered about question pertaining to modern Muslim problems, he would say that the problem is the problem of confusion and error in knowledge. Hmm. It's not simple ignorance. Because sim simply ignorant people or communities, you can you can correct that by by building schools, by giving hmm. the right information. But people who are confused, even with schools and universities. They are still transmitting confusion, mm. and the conception of knowledge is based on different worldview, which would undermine the, the already correct worldview that have been have been taught to you by generations of scholars based on the Quran and the Hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this confusion of error in knowledge to him, to, to me, uh, is very important, and, and he is among the first one who who takes out not just mere ignorance from our problem, but the confusion error in knowledge. Mm. Which is permeated, which is disseminated mostly in higher 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 learning institution and the mass media, mm. and, and 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 connected to that is the loss of adab, and adab here yeah, he uh, he interpreted in, in in the in the original sense as the loss of discipline of the mind and the soul, which make us unable to see different things and and, and put them in the right places, which cause injustice. Mm -hmm. In various real, various realms of reality, yeah. and because of that, we also have not be able to put Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in His right place, and the prophets, and mm -hmm. all the great scholars, and other people also in the right and proper places. Therefore, we are confused in that sense. We put the prophet just like any other prophet, or like any other great leaders. We put say the great imams, Shafi'i, Abu Malik, and and uh, Abu Hanifa. Muhammad, the same like any other imam nowadays who are leading a mosque, for example, or like mm -hmm. any, any other professors. We are equating the Sahaba, brothers, one whom Abu Bakr, Omar, and all hundreds of them as normal uh, uh, people who were shaped by history. Of course, they were shaped by history to some extent, but they were shapers of history also. Mm. And their, their wisdom, their ethics, many of them are. Um, Transcending historical and and and, and, and geographical limitation. Hmm. Do you know, Doctor Wan. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. So 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 what Prohatas has done, I think, and which is relevant to all Muslims, is to 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 reclaim that 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 that, that importance of education, uh, not merely to disseminate information, but to disseminate information and and, and knowledge. Based from particular uh, worldview perspective, mm -hmm. which is rooted in the Quran and the Hadith, and practiced by the Prophet and and and, and the best Muslims uh, with him and after him, mm. and this worldview, this concept of knowledge, have already succeeded in producing great scholars and and, and people, who also produce civilization in various parts of the world. So it's no longer uh, a personalized. Uh, uh, success that we are talking about, we are talking about a civilized, uh, a civilizational success, which has been derived from this framework of looking at things. Yeah. So that's why he said that, that Islam is an ideal, and Islamic history is really a process of Islamization that is done by Muslims. And everywhere they go, you know, some with, a, with different degrees of, of complexity, the diff different degrees of, of success, and so on and so forth. But it is a conscious effort to, to, to transform history, to, to, to share their vision of truth and reality, wherever they are, using wisdom, justice, and other as their guiding principles. Mm. 
You know, Dr. Wan, this is an excellent segue to the question I wanted to ask you. And it's the big question that uh, the Muslims in academia ask themselves, at least me and my friends, is when it comes to Professor Atas, um, would he fall into that category of mujaddid? And for though, and I mean, uh, you can, uh, if you could first explain what the idea of a mujaddid is, and then explain why you think that Professor Atas would fall into that category. Of course, he himself doesn't talk about himself in that category. All great scholars of past did not make claims. It is their work. And people who understand and look at the implication of their work would, would, would refer to, would try to place them yeah? mm -hmm. uh, in, in whatever category they think is fitting. Yeah? Uh, so if, from my perspective, when I compare him with other scholars who live during our time, yeah, they have been great scholars in various fields and all of them making reform. Yeah? Uh, and, and I think Pranak fit into this category of reformers of Mujaddi in the area of Islamic thought, yeah? mm -hmm. in the area of education, because, because he uh, revised what was forgotten, what was confused, uh, uh, which have been properly understood by earlier thinkers, wrote in the Quran and Hadith of the Quran, which mm -hmm. became defining features of our civilization, yeah? mm -hmm. but which have been forgotten, confused. He revised that and placed that in modern context, dealing with modern challenges, that now mostly have been facing in, in, in philosophy, in metaphysics, in education, in, 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 the, in moral life, and so on and so forth. Yeah? Uh, so, so what the thought of um, Mujahid does? Yeah? Hmm. Uh, because because they, they revive something that has been ignored. It has always been there. Something that has been confused. Something that has been reduced into the application. So he put them that, he, he put these ideas back, uh, but suitable for modern times and the future time. So it was not merely cons conserving these ideas, but re reinterpreting them, a process which I call dynamic stabilism. Okay? Hmm. The conservative, they were, they were stabilizing, they preserved uh, all the great things, or many of the great things which uh, earlier Muslims have done, but they were less dynamic because in their preservation, they forgot to deal with the major uh, ideas and challenges which Muslims are facing. The liberals and the secularists, they are dynamic, but they are destabilizing. Hmm. In their effort to change and transform Muslim ideas and Muslim societies, they undermine the core features of what Muslims have, have, have agreed with regard to our worldview, our ethical and legal framework, and even our political uh, ethos, for example. So people like, like Al-Ghazali and like many others before him, after him also, like Shahwallah Dahlawi, they were dynamically stable. Hmm. They, 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 they revived many of the misunderstood, many of the ignored elements of the past and, and reinterpret them and apply them in the modern setting of their time. And that's what Alatas also has been trying to do. Yeah? Mm -hmm. so, 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 so that's why those who, those who, uh, who study from traditional sciences, Mm -hmm. They say, well, this, this is found in our Akhidah, in our, in our, in our Akhidah. They say, yeah, of course, but what have you done with it? <laughs> you read the text, when he went to Iran, they will, they will say, we are reading Al-Farabi, we are reading Prusina, but he asked, what have you done with it? <laughs> yeah? Exactly. But, but he has done something with it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. He applied, he has linked that to, to, to modern epistemological and metaphysical problems. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Uh, so even even in the in the construction of, of the library, for example, or of Istak, the simple thing like for example, he chose the right date to begin Istak, the, the first campus. I was not there when he started it. I was I was in the office. So the next morning he came to me, said Professor Wan, he said Dr. Wan, last night we started Istak. We broke the ground because last night the Prophet went to Isra Mi'raj. Subhanallah. And, 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 and by starting that night, we pray that perhaps some of the blessings. Oh, the wisdom of the prophet would be showered upon us. And then when he built a new campus also, uh, he, I, I was invited there also, and a scholar from Turkey, from the Mehmet Ishala, we were there. And he uttered prayers also, to, to, I think, to asking him to guide us, to protect us. And these elements are, are, are were, not, were, were not traditional to him. 
they keep on doing that all the time. Mm -hmm. But modern universities, when they vote, they, they, they tend to forget about that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a very spiritual, this is metaphysical, nice to do with uh, it has all to do with that. Because knowledge, wisdom, higher education, and to, to revive our civilization depend on Allah's help, depend on, on our sincerity. With mm -hmm. Allah's help and sincerity, then we can we can overcome obstacles, even if we are not given so much facilities. Of course, it doesn't mean that when, when Allah's help, uh, we are not going to face challenges. Sometimes even prophet, they were given food, they were they were they were misunderstood by their own people, even the Sahabah also, some of the extremists misunderstood, some of them, for example, some were murdered. It's a part and parcel of, of living. That's right. We do not regret that. So we understand mm -hmm. that. That's why, despite of him being uh, removed from his his book with great love and sacrifice, there was no bitterness. He keep on producing works, solving one problem after another. He keep on being optimistic, writing, even mm -hmm. with, with great physical uh, difficulty. Right now, still, right now, for example, as, as we are talking, he's trying to finish his. His latest work. <laughs> Subhanallah. <laughs> although, although, although we cannot, we cannot value it oh, properly because of his health. He's mm -hmm. writing long hair. There's no, no computer, no, no secretary. And because of the COVID, uh, COVID travel limitation, we cannot meet him quite often. But he's, he's still writing. He's still writing. But we, that, that, that we must try to contribute until our last breath. Mm -hmm. Trying to help Muslims, trying to lift our our contribution to, to the world, asking for Allah, Allah kind pleasure, inshallah. So I'm sorry like... if my, my conversation is rather rather half but that's no, what no. I thought it would be need to be shared. No, subhanAllah, you mentioned so many beautiful things, Dr. Wan. The idea I never knew that when the, the first day I, that the day the stone was was laid for the beginning of the Aztec coincided with the, with the Al-Isra wal Miraj, subhanAllah. Yeah. And I guess it, it just shows that Professor al Pas is more than just a philosopher, that Islam was central to his identity. And if we look at another um, philosopher as well, uh, someone like Allama Iqbal, um, we tend to forget how religious these people were, how central Islam was to them. But I think, you know, going back to this idea of a mujaddid, the Prophet Sallallahu said at the dawn of every century, there will be somebody who will come and revive the faith. And our scholars have said that this could mean a group of people. It could be more than one people. And to me, I think in the realm of Islamic philosophy, um, after the Enlightenment period, perhaps one of the most prominent ideologies which have emerged is the ideology of secularism. And secularism, because it's something the West has adopted, it's something which appeals to many of the Muslim worlds which are lagging behind. And it seems as a good alternative to adopt uh, the, the framework of secularism. But reading Professor al Pas's book on Islam and secularism reveals that secularism is something which is, as, as a political uh, ideology, is something which is antithetical to Islam. Um, and I was wondering if you could briefly comment on uh, Professor al uh argument for why secularism and Islam are not compatible. Of course, that book which uh, you mentioned uh, is one of his most important works. Although it's very small, barely 120 pages, no footnote, very few footnotes, no bibliography, no index when it was published. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, but as uh, Sheikh Hamza said, that, that one, it is one of the most important books which Muslims have written in the last several centuries. Because it's not, it not only talk about what the major problem of the Muslims are, but how this problem arises and how to overcome this problem. And the biggest problems are the problem of confusion and error in knowledge, and uh, which is due to uh, secularization as a philosophical program and due to loss of Adam. Yeah? Mm. So, so he identified a uh, uh, major problem. Of course, there are many problems because being a military man, he knows that, that you, must, you must understand all the major problems, the physical, the, the economic, yeah? the scientific, but these are underlying problems. Mm. 
the basic problem which uh, which permeates all these other problems of confusion and error in knowledge and the loss of other. Uh, both of these problems uh, have got different sources. The, 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 of course, the secularization as a philosoph philosophical program uh, is one prominent factor for the confusion of an error in knowledge uh, problem that we are suffering from right now, eh? mm. uh, together with the loss of other. So, so, so he doesn't talk about secularization as a political agenda because to him that is a, that is a not so not very not very significant. But what is more significant for him is to understand secularization as a philosophical program. What mm. happens in the mind of the secularists, for example, their worldview, the concept of knowledge, their ethical framework, yeah? their, 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 their vision of truth and their and reality, which also permeates not just politics, but the economic and other sectors. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But many people look at secularization as only a political thing. Yeah? Mm. Yes, so, yes. Uh, so they think that when you have a, a religious a religious party or a religious state, you can overcome secularization. But really what we are seeing now that even in, in religious political parties, they are secular in thinking. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Where, where God, where truth and ethics are no longer significant, are no longer determining force, even in Islam, in, in religiously based political parties, but rather power, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Certain kind of say uh, religion-based institution, whether economic or, 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 or education or commercial, yeah. The binding factor, the, the, the guiding factors were not God or truth or sharia, but rather business, profit, mm -hmm. fame, and popularity and such. Therefore, even religion-based entities may not be non-secular in, in, in their philosophies and framework. That's why his emphasis has always been that secularization that he's, he's opposing and which he wants Muslims to understand, not as a political thing. Mm -hmm. But rather as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a philosophical agenda, what goes on in our mind, in our consciousness, and how will reality, and truth, and knowledge, and happiness, and development, and many other things. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And that requires tremendous knowledge of ourselves and of the West also, because he's not against the West as such. He's not against secular aspect of the West. For example, economy is a secular thing, mm -hmm. politics is a secular thing. Business is secular thing, but these are not and these are not against Islam. Science is quite secular, for example. So to study secular sciences, quote unquote, is not negative. Yeah? Because Muslims must study all sciences. Mm -hmm. Because to study the world is to study God's knowledge, God's attributes and names which are reflected in this in this creation of the world, for example. Mm -hmm. So 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 we don't separate between between the world and religion as such between dunya and akhirah as such. Mm -hmm. It is always integrated in our mind, in our worldview. Uh, so, but most people uh, limit secularization as only in the limited to political dimension. So they want to create so-called Islamic state, Islamic mm -hmm. party. But their behavior, their ideas are really secular <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> because these parties, these states are fighting only for secular agenda. And where they want to implement Islam in the agenda is done in a very secular manner, by force, not by proper education, not by proper exemplification of right adab of the leader, isn't it? As, mm. as reflected especially by the Prophet Muhammad and the companion. Of course, they implement the laws too. But underlying this law, it is about, about, about love, about respect, about justice, which seems to be much absent in the in, in the in the discourse and practice of many people who are involved in so-called religion-based political parties in the Muslim countries, mm -hmm. uh, so so that book is very important, and 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 he, he talked about the, the basic problems and where these problems are coming from, but how to solve them. The mm -hmm. solving of this problem is not just by education at the primary school level, at the kindergarten level, at the secondary school level. All these levels are important but at the level of the university, at the level of higher education. And he took that from the history of the prophets. Because even though all prophets are sent to, to all levels of people in their communities, and they got the Prophet Muhammad Sallam to all mankind, okay? but their direct audience were the thinking people, were people who were able to understand 
the value of people. They are adult in that sense. So higher education to him, the, the most effective strategy to overcome our problem is to revitalize our higher education institution. And that's why I thought, and, and I think Hamza mentioned it also, that Zaytona was inspired by that. Mm. Yeah? Because, because, for example, look at the history of conversion of people who revert to Islam, even during the time of the Prophet, for example. Although there were some young people like Sayyidina Ali, yeah? and a few others, but most were the adults. Mm -hmm. These are the people who transform our civilization. And those who, are, those who become Muslim now, in the West, in Japan, in Korea, in New Zealand, they were all university, basically, uh, people. Yes. Yeah? Yes. And, and the biggest problem also are there. Muslims who become, who become utterly secular, who become utterly materialistic, are products from higher education also, isn't it? Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you see, the best strategy is to reform our higher educational institution. But that's where we are failing. Okay? Mm -hmm. And exactly. that's why also his conception of, of world, world view mm. or Islamization of modern, modern sciences is very important because the, the, the primary uh, space for this thing to be discussed and to be implemented is at that level. Not in the political sense, not in the bureaucratic sense, but in the, in the intellectual and moral sense. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very difficult thing to do. But that's how he sees he see so how Islam spread all over the world. Wherever Islam went, it first transformed the worldview, the intellectual and moral framework of the people. Mm -hmm. The political, the legal part came later. And the Islamization of the Malay world in particular, where there were, there were no military uh, military uh, influence at all in the beginning centuries. Yeah. yeah. Only, only the scholars who came here, they brought in one, one, one legal thinking, one, uh, one theological thinking, one uh, Sufi, Sufi thinking. They managed to unify thousands of islands from Indonesia, Brunei, Philippines, Thailand, Cambodia, without any more really external political support. How did they do that? Because of education. At mm -hmm. what level? At a higher level. And they were able to do that effectively because of the, the, I think the qualities of these people. They were people who came from established Muslim family. You said that the Sayyid Islam. Yeah? So they knew how to practice Islam with, any, with extremism. They knew how to adapt also to local cultures. They pick up Malay name, they pick up Malay, Malay cuisine, they pick up Malay dresses, and so, so forth. So therefore, the Islamization is, is both. Uh, uh, bringing in the, the original Islamic ideas, but also transforming and absorbing the local customs and tradition. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's very unique in that sense. Exactly. And, you know, Dr. Wan, um, one of the most, uh, I, think, I think probably the, the, the most prominent and beautiful idea or concept that I've learned from Professor Althaus is what I learned when I was in uh, the Y the summer school program is this idea that the entire universe is a, is a book. Yeah. But Professor Atas says that the Quran is a book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and everything in, in the Quran is an ayat, meaning yeah. everything in the book is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says the same thing is like that with the universe, where the entire universe is a book and everything within that book is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in order to under, if you want to ever understand an author, you need to understand their book. And if we want to get some level of idea of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, we reflect upon the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And throughout the Quran, you will find these verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to reflect upon the night and the day, the oceans, reflect upon your own self. And when I, I remember learning that concept from, from Professor Althaus, it was a complete change in worldview. Because as you mentioned, secularism uh, is a philosophical program. It, it's, it's an entire way of looking at the world. And once I learned that concept, I began to look at nature completely different. When I would begin to see the trees, 
when I would begin to see the stars, the oceans, the fish, I began to see all of these things as a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And unfortunately, because of the, mod the modern world, which has become very um, atheistic, materialistic, you see these as just merely objects with, and you miss the real essence, the mahiya, the quiddity of the object. And Professor Atlas's diagnosis was entirely correct that we need to revive this component of our worldview of seeing every single thing that exists as a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we understand that, we start treating everything around us knowing that this is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not something that's meant to be tampered with or to be exploited. Yeah, you are right there. Of course, uh, uh, it is the, the idea, the idea is coming from the, from, from the Quran, of course. And all traditional Muslim scholars in the past were talking about that. And in the modern world, people like, say, Ustaz Badir Alman Said Nursi from Turkey mm -hmm. has talked about that also. Yeah? But among, among the modern, modern trained scholars, they rarely talk about that, except mm -hmm. maybe Professor Atas and, and, and Professor Satan Nas uh, from in Washington right now, yeah, mm -hmm. for example. Um, so, 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 Alhamdulillah, uh, uh, this, but, but he doesn't talk only about that, but he, he leave it. Mm -hmm. You see how he designed the, the, the campus of his time, mm -hmm. the reflection of that thing, and how he defined knowledge also. Knowledge yeah, as being the unit of meaning, which, uh, which which enables you to place everything in the right order. So that it will lead you to recognize Allah in the right place. So ultimately, everything that we look at, everything that we do is about realizing who Allah is in, mm -hmm. in his various names and attributes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. so classical Muslim calls to Allah as ma'rifah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. we, we must be aware all the time of, the, of Allah's presence in, in in everything, around everything, after everything, before everything, for example. Yeah? So we are, we are in that state all the time. So, so that's why if you go to, you see, you see the Quranic verses, he, he plays everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah? On the wall. Yeah? And even when he designed, he designed the fountains. Yeah? In the old respect, he designed some small fountains with, with uh, say, lion, three, four lion. But that lion was carrying a throw of water. Because in our symbolism, lion represents courage. courage. Water represents knowledge and wisdom. So, so there, there's integrity between, between say, wisdom and, and, and courage and power. Because modern society has so much power of, 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 of economic power, financial power, technical power, but no wisdom. Hmm. Traditional, traditional society may have power, but no, may, may have wisdom, but no power. So to him, uh, what we want to establish at this time is to, to produce Muslims who are powerful, but guided and respecting wisdom. Mm. Yeah. And in the new campus, which is good, we have about several lions, I think 12 lions, right? around, around the big fountain, all spouting, spouting water. So there, the integrity again between power and wisdom and knowledge there. Yeah. Mm. So, so it, is, it, is, it is put in practice in symbolic form, not just in, in, in words, but in, in architecture, in his art also as well. Yeah. He's also a, a good artist. He, he, has, he, has, he has written, drawn many calligraphic pieces, you know, which symbolize something. And, and so, so that's why we said earlier that, that once in a while, Allah bless us with scholars like this. Mm -hmm. But as, uh, as is normally the case, scholars like this, it took time for, for the, their community to properly appreciate them. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah, I think more and more now, for the last several decades, more and more uh, younger generation of scholars and professionals from, from many countries are beginning to appreciate. And that's why we are saying now that, that, that for, perhaps for the first time, the thinking of some scholars in the Malay world are contributing to the development and the enrichment of the, of the larger Muslim communities globally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we hope that this will continue. And we also have been meeting from, from the writing of great calls from everywhere, from Middle East, from India, Pakistan, from, from Europe, from North America also. So right now, the mutual learning of Muslims are becoming more and more, it's becoming more and more, I think, uh, real and, and, and better, inshallah, as time goes on. Mm -hmm, inshallah. And I think this is a great 
uh, one of the great things about technology is although both of us are living in completely different time zones, um, we're able to have uh, a podcast like this very easily. Um, and alhamdulillah, inshallah, mm-hmm. you know, we pray that this is the beginning of uh, 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 the beginning of many of many podcasts, the beginning of many institutions, inshallah, that will share um, not only the great vision of Sayyid Muhammad Naqib al Atas, but also of our great scholars, of our great philosophers. Um, and it was it was an absolute honor having you join us, Doctor Juan. Um, Thank you. We we really appreciate it, and um, we we hope this is our way of trying to bring some sort of uh, of of a legacy to Professor Alpas here in the West, um, where the where his ideas have disseminated, but not the name. And now we're trying to attach the name to the ideas. So thank you so much, Doctor Juan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Juan. Inshallah, uh, to everybody that's listening, um, I, w- I will post the information uh, that, that was mentioned in here, the books, because I'm sure people will be interested in. Um, and if you have any other feedback, any other questions, by all means, please feel free to message me. And with that, we will conclude. Jazakumullah khairan, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.